Brief Bibliography Few books in English deal directly with the events that concern us. The bibliography of the German and Italian movements is lengthy and unsatisfactory. That for Belgium and Romania is non-existent. In brackets, it is best there to read the books of Cadrenu and de Grel. End brackets. Those interested in exploring the question further might begin with Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism, in brackets, New York, 1958, end brackets, Robert Burns' Anti-Semitism in Modern France, in brackets, New Brunswick, 1950, end brackets, Hans Kohn, The Idea of Nationalism, in brackets, New York, 1943, end brackets, and Ernst Nolte, Der Faschimus in seiner Epoch, in brackets, Munich, 1963, end brackets, soon to be published in an American translation. If they feel somewhat confused by the different points of view, they had better remember that confusion is the essence of historical reality. On the different countries that have been mentioned, again, there are few publications available in English. For Germany, the best are Alan Bullock, Hitler, A Study in Tyranny, in brackets, New York, 1952, and brackets, and Andrew G. Whiteside, in quotations, The Nature and Origins of National Socialism, end quotations, in the Journal of Central European Affairs, volume 17, in brackets, 1957-58, end brackets, pages 48 to 73. There may be supplemented by Theodore Abel, Why Hitler Came Into Power, in brackets, New York, 1938, and Milton Mayer, They Thought They Were Free, the Germans, 1933-45, to 45, in brackets, Chicago, 1955, end brackets. On Italy, we have Dennis Mack Smith, Italy, in brackets, Ann Arbor, 1959, end brackets. Dante El Germino, The Italian Fascist Party in Power, in brackets, Minneapolis, 1959, end brackets and Federico Chabod's beautifully clear and brief Italia Contemporanea, 1918-1948, in brackets, Turin, 1961, end brackets. The English movements are presented in James Drennan, B.U.F., Oswald Mosley, and British Fascism, in brackets, London, 1934, end brackets, and Colin Cross, The Fascists in Britain, London, 1961, end brackets. Two good books have recently been devoted to Spanish fascism. Stanley Payne, Falange, in brackets, Stanford, 1961, end brackets, and Bernd Nelson, Die Verbotene Revolution, Aufstieg und Niedergang der Falange, in brackets, Hamburg, 1963, end brackets. Istvan Dijk's master's thesis, National Socialism in Hungary, in brackets, Columbia, New York, no date, end brackets, becomes accessible in the chapter he contributes to The Right, a Historical Profile, edited by Hans Roger and Eugen Weber, in brackets, Berkeley, 1964, end brackets. The student of contemporary Hungary must, however, consult C.A. McCartney's monumental History of Modern Hungary, 1929-45, to two volumes, in brackets, Edinburgh, 1956, end brackets. For France, C. E. Weber, Action Francaise, in brackets, Stanford, 1962, end brackets. And, more broadly, J. Plumien and R. Lassier, Les Fascissimis Francais, in brackets, Paris, 1963, end brackets. Most illuminating, however, are the writings of leaders and militants themselves. Their very vagueness and occasional incoherence can help to explain the nature of their appeal. Final Remarks from the Narrator This concludes Eugen Weber's work, Varieties of Fascism. At the heart of this book lays the definitional and operative distinction between National Socialism, or Nazism, and Fascism as well as their uniform emergence from a certain type of disaffected socialist persons in the early 20th century. In a reductionist summary of the work, 
a few primary ideas can be described. First, is that fascism and national socialism, while sharing in many attributes, differ on their ideological burdens. National socialism, in its pursuit of a nationalist, anti-capitalist nation-state, feels itself bounded in some way that isn't merely limited to how the nation is defined, be it by race, language, religion, or some other factor. National socialism, as in Germany, with its emphasis on totalitarian organization of capital and family, or in Romania, with its emphasis on a moral purification of an ascended Romanian man, has some boundaries in which it refuses to cast away, or at least always aims to achieve. Conversely, fascism may be described as the utmost personification of political pragmatism. For the fascist, only whatever defines the nation is what remains static. All other policies and objectives that the fascist may employ are purely tools to be used, abused, and discarded if it works for the furthering of the nation, whatever that may mean. The fascist then, in coining a new term, could be described instead as a movement of national revolutionism, wherein the state perpetuates a Jacobin-like pragmatic revolution forever. In these positions, the major cleavings between the two ideologies are found. However, they both share a strong nationalism and a dictatorial and or corporatist state structure. However, it appears that the anti-capitalism of fascism may merely be a fad. The abolition of private property may work for the nation at one time, for the fascist, and may not work at another time, precipitating its return. In any event, the nationalistic core beliefs of both these theories put them necessarily at odds with Marxist internationalism, despite often having comparable desires and policies. The purpose of narrating this work was primarily driven by the alarmingly incorrect perception and application of terms such as fascism and Nazi in the current political climate. Fascism, as Eugen Weber mentioned in the first chapter, is often merely used to give a dog a bad name, and, as Weber writes this in 1964, it feels safe to assume that this trend has become even more widespread. This watering down of the terms fascist and national socialist has had the effect of erasing just what these movements stand for and result in horrifying ironies in all parts of the political spectrum. Groups, as existing at this time, such as Antifa, tick all the boxes of proto-fascist syndicalist groups as seen by the Falange in Spain or those under Georges Sorel, and yet the irony and watering down of the term has made them unaware vampiric even, in the inability to see their fascism, staring back at them through the slit in their black cloth-covered faces. While, in other areas, persons who actually more likely fall under a traditional conservatism or even a traditional liberalism have, in the same vein of not understanding the terms, taken to be both identified with or sympathizing of such groups. This is then the meaning of words, not in some Wittgenstein or postmodern sense, but in a purely operatic and historical sense. Those unknowing in what they profess can often profess what they knowingly wish to defeat. So, this marks the end of this particular work. While more content on these ideologies will be coming, other content on other political, historical, philosophical, legal, and artistic topics is planned. I hope this work has been helpful. Sincerely, The Narrator.